So what do you guys do when you start running out of room in your garage? Do you guys get rid of the things that don't bring you joy? But what if all of your things bring you joy? Then I guess you gotta build more things to store all the things that bring you joy. Hey guys, so we're taking a quick little look into my garage right now. And if you guys are anything like me, then over the years, you start collecting a lot of tools and eventually you start having kids and you start collecting things like wagons and tricycles, bicycles, and all sorts of junk. And one of the things that I constantly struggle with is the battle for floor space in my garage. Now, the obvious solution is to start using overhead storage. And I've employed that for a lot of my tools and other things but one of the more annoying things to store are bicycles. So today we're gonna to be building a bicycle lift and this is gonna swing up and down from the ceiling for easy access so you don't need to climb a ladder while holding a bicycle and then fall off and break your neck. It's gonna swing down from the ceiling so you can easily store your bicycles and access them when you need them and it's gonna swing up and out of the way when you don't need them so you win back that floor space. So before building anything, I took some general measurements of the garage and the space that I was working within. So things like joists that I knew that I was gonna to have to screw into to support the bicycle lift, as well as obstacles like my car lift and the garage door opener, and even the space that I had between the car lift and the opposing wall. So I knew that I could fit the bicycles in that space even underneath the bulkhead that I have also in the garage. So there's a few things I need to work around and I need to know the envelope that I was working within to design this bicycle lift. And you can see here how it would lift up and the bicycles themselves would sit and tuck themselves nicely under that bulkhead. Now this lift specifically fits my space, but as with most of my projects, I do provide the design files down in the video description below. So check that out because you might be able to modify them to fit your space or give you inspiration for your own project. With the general design laid out, I started by cutting the long vertical members of the swinging bicycle mount portion. And I'm just using some generic two by two framing lumber to build this portion here. And then I'm gonna mark out the locations where I'm gonna be using half lap joints to secure the two long members together with the cross members. And so I'm using my miter saw here with a pretty common technique to create those half lap grooves in those long vertical members. And then I can use another piece of two by two here to test the fit of the groove and make sure it's nice and snug. I'm making my swinging frame 24 inches wide. So I'm laying out my three cross members and then I am going to use the same technique to cut the half lap grooves in those horizontal cross members. With the horizontal and vertical cross members cut and grooved, I can move on to the next step of gluing and screwing them together. I'm actually elevating this off the ground a little bit with some two by fours so I can get the clamps underneath without them sitting on the ground. But basically it's pretty straightforward. Like I said, glue, screw, clamp, let that glue cure, and then we can move on to the next step. Along the way, don't forget to check that your frame is squared up in the corners. Now I'm gonna be working on the diagonal members. So I've laid another two by two across, clamped down into place, and I'm gonna mark off the cuts that I need to make, and I'm gonna get that on the miter saw. Now it turns out that on the miter saw, my cuts actually exceed the maximum angle that my saw can cut. So I've kind of spaced it off of the miter saw fence, and I'm gonna score the line to make sure that my blade is lined up, and then I'm just gonna slice through those real quick. And even if you don't have a miter saw, uh, just to demonstrate on the other side, I've cut the same cut with my regular circular saw. Then it's time for a little more glue and screw on those long diagonal members. And so you can see there that I threw in a little bit of a pilot hole since I'm gonna be trying to screw this thing in on a diagonal face. And once the screw is in on both sides, then we can move on to the shorter diagonal members that we're gonna cut again from a single longer piece here. So I've got it laid out on top and I'm using my pen or pencil to mark off those next four cuts to get those shorter diagonal members cut. With the short diagonal members cut, we can line them up, clamp them, glue them, screw them, and then move on to the other half of the frame to complete the same process on the other side. And once that's done, you should have something that looks like this. Since one of my bikes is an e-bike and it's pretty heavy, 
I'm really gonna beef this frame up and I'm gonna be using some three quarter inch OSB here to create some gussets that I'm gonna be using in order to stiffen up this frame and strengthen it even more. So these gusset plates are going to reinforce all of the joints where the different members meet one another and I'm gonna be using the same wood glue and screwing procedure to make sure that I get a nice solid connection at all of those joints. Now I'm putting all of my gussets on the back side of the frame that way they don't interfere with the bicycles when I go and mount them onto this swinging frame, except for the gussets at the top of the frame. Later on, we're gonna be putting some 3 8 inch rod through the two by two pieces of wood and the whole thing is gonna swivel about that. So I want the gussets on the other side to keep that rod from tearing through those two by two pieces of wood. And then we're left with this frame here. And as I described on the one side, you can see that the gussets are on the opposite side on the top. Now I can move on to building the stationary frame that will mount to the ceiling. And this is going to be made from regular two x four framing lumber. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut all of my pieces to length. Then I'm gonna start laying out the general design here. I'm gonna be using groove joints again to join these pieces together and make a nice solid frame. So in order to do that, I need to make sure that my table saw in this case, where I'm cutting these groove joints, is nice and true. So I've got that set up and I'm ready to start cutting in those grooves into the two x four pieces so I can all mate together. As you can see, it's a similar approach to what I was doing earlier with the miter saw, whereby I'm taking small incremental cuts in order to get a bigger groove. Once the groove is complete, another two x four should fit in nice and snug. And then from there, we can move on to the gluing and screwing procedure again in order to get the cross members onto those vertical members and end up with a nice solid frame. On the free and open end of the stationary frame, I'm gonna be drilling a clearance hole for the 3 8 inch threaded rod that the entire swinging frame is going to pivot about. The rod should pass through the hole freely but without an excess amount of slop or play. What's also important here is that you drill that hole straight and true to the frame because you're gonna be drilling the same hole on the other side. So eventually I got my hole together here and I started using a drill block that I made to get a nice straight hole. The drill block was made on my drill press so I know that that hole is straight and true. And you can see here that I have a pretty accurate hole and down on the other side of my frame, the rod still fits through with very little misalignment. You want this rod to be as straight as possible. I'm gonna be repeating this process on the end of the swinging frame where we put those gussets on the opposite side of the frame. Now I'm gonna locate my holes in a spot where they will not interfere with the diagonal cross members. I'm gonna be drilling into a nice straight piece of that two by two. I'm gonna be using my drill block again to make sure my hole is nice and straight. So again, the rod will pass through straight and true through both sides of the frame and not get twisted up or get locked up in there. On the swinging frame, I am gonna be doing one thing a little bit different and I am gonna be using these flanged bushings that I 3D printed. And so I'm gonna to have to come back in here and enlarge those holes like you see I've done here for that flanged bushing to fit in place. Again, it shouldn't be too loose, just enough for it to fit without much play. On the other side of the swinging frame, I'm gonna be drilling out clearance holes for my lifting eyes. And I'm gonna be using some oversized washers on both sides to better distribute the load and prevent any sort of pullout. With the lifting eyes installed, I can move on to installing the chain links onto both lifting eyes, and so I'm just gonna be connecting the two together. Next, I'm gonna tackle the upper mounts for the stationary frame. I'm using regular old steel angle iron here, and I believe it's about an eighth inch thick or about three millimeters. I'm gonna mark it to length where we're gonna cut it to fit the frame, and then I'm gonna mark some positions in the middle where I'm gonna be drilling some clearance holes for some extra hardware. We'll see more about that a little bit later. I'm using a chop saw here to cut my pieces to length, but you can also use a cutoff wheel on an angle grinder. So I couldn't really capture this next part on camera as it was too difficult to fit myself into the video frame while I was standing on the top rung of the ladder, sweating my nuts off in the summer heat, holding the stationary frame in one hand, a pencil in the other hand, trying to accurately position this thing and mark off the location of the joist in relation to the actual stationary frame. But I did get the result, so I got my mark. And this represents the center of one joist when this frame is positioned correctly on the ceiling. And now that I have the one mark, I can just measure 16 inches from there and I'll have the center of the second joist that I'm gonna tie into. The reason for doing this is that I'm going to transfer all of these marks over to the angle iron so I can get them on my drill press and drill the clearance holes for both the structural screws that I'm gonna be using to mount this frame to the joists themselves 
and for some M8 hardware that I had laying around. And what you're gonna see that I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take the two angle iron pieces that go on both sides of the stationary frame and I'm gonna slip a M8 bolt right through the two pieces of angle iron, through the frame, wooden frame itself, and it's gonna actually sandwich the whole thing together and make sure that it really solidifies this thing as one solid piece. And speaking of structural screws, if you guys haven't used these before, I would highly recommend them. These are Timberlock structural screws and they replace 3 8 inch leg bolts. You do not have to do any sort of pre-drilling, so you don't run the risk of oversizing your pilot hole. You can just drive them right into your wood and they hold really, really strong. So right here, you'll see that I'm drilling out those clearance holes for the M8 bolts, which I previously mentioned are going to sandwich the angle iron together on both sides of the stationary frame. And with those clearance holes drilled out, I can move the longer piece of angle iron into place. I can slip in my M8 socket head cap screws, and then I can take the two ends of my longer piece of angle iron and secure them into place with the structural screws. Then I'm gonna flip the whole frame over. I'm gonna take the shorter piece of angle iron, and I'm gonna actually secure it into place with those two M8 screws. And so what I'm left with here is a nice flat mounting surface, and you can see the four clearance holes for the structural screws that will tie into the ceiling joists when I get this thing mounted up. Of course, I didn't capture this process on camera because of the ridiculous sweaty balancing act I had to perform. Standing on the top rung of the ladder, holding this thing above my head with one arm and the other hand trying to drill those structural screws in place, but eventually I did get it up and I'm giving it the hanging man test here with 200 pounds of human meat hanging off of it and shaking. From there, we're gonna attach some diagonal braces here just made from two by two lumber. And these are going to attach to the ceiling joist with a similar method as the entire frame using this angle iron. I'm gonna take this two by four here and I'm gonna actually attach that to the angle iron with some wood screws. So you'll see me drive these in or at least, you know, attempt to drive them in. and then get back up on the ladder and screw the angle iron into the joist and get the diagonal members screwed into that two by four. And so at this point, I was done, sort of. I actually realized that I put this thing in the wrong place and I mounted it too close to my car lift. So I actually had to take it all down and do it again. With the stationary frame now in the correct position, I could take the swinging frame and mount it up with that 3 8 inch rod and hang it from the stationary frame. And this is what I'm left with. So you can see here that the 3 8 inch rod goes through both frames and the swinging frame pivots about that rod. And if you look closely in between the two, you can see the flanged bushing and there is a gap that is maintained between the two frames in order to prevent these two things from binding and rubbing against one another. To make our bicycle lift a lift, we need something to provide some lift. And so what I'm gonna be using here is a hand winch. And I got this from Princess Auto because I'm in Canada. If you guys are in the United States, you guys can also pick these up at Harbor Freight. It's basically the same store. And I got it for real cheap. This thing ran me about 30 bucks, came with the cable and everything. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the drum off and that's just gonna be loosening off and removing this one bolt that runs right through the drum. And I'll be left with the mounting bracket. What you see me doing here now is putting a clamp on that drum to keep the steel cable from unraveling. It uh, actually acts a bit like a spring and it'll want to shoot apart. So you can just use a clamp to hold that together. We're gonna to be taking the bracket and we're gonna be using it to mark off the mounting locations on the wall. In my case, I have a block wall, so I'm gonna be using some concrete anchors to anchor my winch to the wall. If you guys have a wood framed garage, you are going to want to anchor your winch to a stud. So keep that in mind. You're gonna need something solid to mount this thing to. One other quick tip is that if you guys have a laser level, you can throw that right on the middle of your frame. You can project your laser line down onto the opposite wall, and that'll help you line up your mounting holes perfectly centered with your frame for your hand winch. With the hole locations marked, it was hammer time with the hammer drill, and I could knock out the pilot holes for the concrete anchors, and then of course, screw in my hand winch frame. I mounted my hand winch on the wall at a height that was accessible without using a ladder. And therefore, up at the top of the wall, I'm gonna need something like this pulley block to loop the line up and over and then pull up on the swinging frame 
to get it to swing up towards the ceiling. So I got these little pulley blocks, again from Princess Auto, which is the equivalent of Harbor Freight in the United States. And unfortunately, my concrete anchors don't fit through the mounting holes, so I'm gonna need something else to mount them to and then mount that to my block wall. So I got this C-channel iron, and it's essentially very similar to the angle iron I'm using. I believe it's about an eighth of an inch thick, about three millimeters. I'm gonna drill two holes in the sides for my concrete anchors to go through, and I'm gonna drill four holes that match the mounting holes on the pulley block. And I'm gonna mount those directly to this C-channel. Then it's back up on the ladder to mark out the hole locations for this plate and drill the pilot holes for the concrete anchors that will hold this in place. The hook on the end of my winch cable is crimped into place and the hook doesn't fit between the pulley block and the plate. So I have to actually put the cable through first and then mount the pulley block on top sandwiching that cable in between the block and the plate and I'm going to be using some M4 hardware to secure this pulley block to this plate and then once that's done I can get the concrete anchors in and get this thing up on the wall. So things were seemingly looking pretty good at this point for me but for those of you guys who know anything about hand winches you know that these horizontal hand winches aren't exactly ideal for vertical lifting applications. And so I ran into two problems, the first of which I knew right from the beginning and I knew I could solve, and that is the hand crank lever. It's mounted to the side of this particular winch and I cannot make full revolutions as the wall is in the way. And so how I solved that was by double nutting the bolt on the end of there, and then I figured I could use an electric wrench in order to raise and lower the lift. The problem with this approach is that an impact wrench is, well, an impact wrench. It shakes the shit out of this thing and then it eventually loosens off the screw style concrete anchors that I have holding this thing together. And that's no good. The second more problematic issue that I had to deal with here is that the cheap winch that I'm using is a spur gear style winch and it does not have a brake. So when I'm switching between the lifting and lowering functions, if there's any sort of a load on my frame, the whole thing tends to just fall and freewheel, which is obviously not good because if you have anything heavy on there, let's say like my e-bike, it's gonna land right on my head. And so just like in baseball, it's two strikes and this winch is out of there. Two, two strikes, right? Let me know in the comments section. What I switched over to was a worm gear style winch and it solved all of my problems. The hand crank mechanism is on the front, so I could use the hand crank mechanism, but it is pretty slow. So a worm gear gives you a very high mechanical advantage. It automatically breaks, so I won't have that problem of freewheeling. But the cost of this is that it is very, very slow. Hand cranking just won't work for me. But because the hand crank mechanism is on the front, I could remove the hand crank, double nut it again, and then use my regular hand drill without impact function to turn that hand crank mechanism all day long so it gives me a reasonable speed up and down and it's silky smooth with no extra vibrations. Now in those previous clips you may have noticed that the frame magically turned black so I did paint the frame black. I spent several hours doing it for the sole purpose of making this whole thing more presentable for the fine audience of YouTube out there and also you would have noticed that some of the bicycles were actually mounted to the frame. To mount the bikes, I came up with these pegs here which hook into the bicycle frames and I blocked them in with two by two material and on the ends of the pegs, I cut some chamfers into there to easily guide the frames onto those pegs. If you have a heavier bike like this e-bike that I built, I would highly recommend putting that heavier bike in the lower position and obviously having your lighter bike in the uppermost position so it's easier to lift overhead. This e-bike would be rather difficult to lift over my head and so it fits nicely in this lower position and it's really easy to lift only about a foot off the ground to get it up and on to the swinging frame. Once the bicycle frames are on the swinging frame, there's not much needed to hold them in place. I'm gonna use a few bungee cords here as an added measure, but once you start swinging the swinging frame up, it positions itself underneath of the bicycle frames and there's really nowhere for them to go anyways. What's also kind of cool about this bicycle lift is that even if you don't swing the whole frame up into the horizontal position, even in the vertical position, the frame still saves you quite a bit of space as you can still stack two bikes vertically. But when you do have the bikes in the horizontal position up on your ceiling, you do save the most amount of floor space 
and there still is easy access to these things as you can just lower them at any time, unhook them and get your bikes down. No need to climb a ladder. What you guys might also notice in some of these clips here is that I did add a second pulley block to the wall. You can see it right there. And that is a safety measure in case the first block fails, the second one will still catch the load and prevent the thing from falling. So that's it for this build guys. Be sure to let me know what you guys thought in the comment section down below, whether it's good or bad. Just let me know. I'd also love to hear some general feedback on my content in general on my channel. So be sure to check out some of my other videos. And if you guys really like my stuff, feel free to like and subscribe. It definitely helps. Encourage me to continue doing projects like this. Also, don't forget to check out the video description. This is where I put all the resources for projects so you guys can recreate them. Things like drawings and links to parts that I've used. So definitely check that out. And I'll see you guys in the next video.